Okay, welcome back to the lab. Now today, I want to talk about the fundamentals of rocket propulsion. Now this video is going to include some demonstrations and some basic video animations to give you a better appreciation for how rocket motors work. Now, before we get to the fire and smoke, let's take a look at the fundamentals of thrust production. Okay, so let's begin by looking at the fundamental aspects of rocket propulsion. First of all, fuel is burned in a combustion chamber that has an opening at the back end, and that opening is called the nozzle. The combustion process converts a solid or a liquid fuel into a high pressure gas. And the high pressure inside the combustion chamber causes mass to migrate towards the opening at the back end of the motor. Now here's what the pressure profile looks like inside the rocket motor. First of all, we have combustion, and that creates pressure forces on the top of the casing, on the bottom of the casing, on the front, and the back of the casing. Now, the upward and downward forces don't contribute to the leftward force creating the thrust in this picture, so we can eliminate those. And also, if you look at the right-hand side of the motor, there's a hole at the back end. Now, there's no surface for the pressure to act on, so there's no pressure force acting in the area of the throat of the nozzle. So if we eliminate balanced forces again, we see that we have a leftward force created by the pressure inside the casing. There's also a pressure inside the nozzle, exit cone, and this acts perpendicular to the surfaces. If we break those pressures up into components, eliminate the up and down forces that don't contribute to the actual thrust of the rocket motor, we see a pressure force on the exit cone of the nozzle. Now it's these leftward acting forces that are actually the thrust of the rocket motor. So, how do we get the high pressure gases inside the rocket motor? Well, the answer to that question is combustion. It's the chemical reaction that converts a solid or a liquid fuel into a high pressure gas. Let's take a quick look at the combustion process. Now, there are three things that are needed for combustion to occur. First, we need some sort of fuel. Second, we need oxygen. And finally, we need a heat source to get the reaction going. Now, if any one of these three things is absent, the combustion process will never start. Or if it's started and one of these is taken away, the combustion process will actually stop. Now, let's take a look at rocket propellant. Rocket propellant includes fuel, usually something with lots of carbon, such as hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene, or HTPB, to the rocket world. Now, rocket propellant also includes its own oxygen. For a solid-fueled rocket motor, this might be ammonium perchlorate, which is also known as AP. Now, if oxygen is built into the propellant, it doesn't need any oxygen from the outside atmosphere. So, with that said, can a rocket motor work in the vacuum of space? Or is it possible for a rocket motor to work underwater? Now, the answer to both these questions is yes. So, do we need proof that a rocket motor can actually work underwater? Well, let's do a simple experiment using a model rocket motor to see if we can actually get it to burn underwater. Here's my test setup, an aquarium full of water with a rocket motor inside. Now I have the rocket motor sealed with wax so the water can't get to the propellant before ignition. There we go, we see flame, so the rocket motor is actually burning underwater. So I said earlier, rocket propellant has its own fuel and oxygen. Two of the items needed for combustion to occur. But where does the third item come from? Where does the heat come from? Now, the initial heat to get the chemical reaction started is supplied by the igniter. The igniter burns, ignites propellant, and once that happens, the chemical reaction is a self-sustaining reaction, and thus motor propellant will continue to burn. Now, let's take a look at a model rocket igniter. I have one right here in my hand. You can probably barely see it. Now, this igniter works almost the same way as a bigger NASA-sounding rocket motor igniter except a NASA igniter produces a lot more heat and a lot more pressure to ignite a much larger rocket motor. So now let's take a look and experiment to see how a model rocket igniter works. Now, here's the igniter, it's a model rocket igniter. And this is a little graphic of what it looks like. We have the wire leads that uh, lead to the uh, firing lines of the ignition system, and those are depicted here. This blue represents a pyrogen type material that burns once it's subjected to heat. And that is this material here. And we have a small bridge wire 
which is a high resistance wire that heats up when current is passed through it. Again, that's what initiates the igniter. Now what we'll do is we'll uh, run the test. As we apply current and voltage to the igniter, eventually once the current voltage is high enough, we'll see the igniter go off. And there you have it. Now, let's take a look at the test setup we used. Here's a test setup for our igniter test. What I have is a digital voltmeter here, reading the voltage of the power supply. I've got a current meter, reading the amount of current passing through the igniter. Full scale deflection is one amp. So we have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 amps, and so on. And here's a model rock igniter. Now let's run the test and see what happens. We wanna watch the voltage and the current. So what you see is a small increase in the voltage. You'll see the current go up. And here you see the current is at 0.1 amps, but the igniter still has not gone off and we're running about 0.83 volts. Now, because there's a closed circuit in here with the uh, igniter, it's actually drawing down the power supply. So the actual voltage being supplied to the igniter is greater than 0.83 volts. And we'll see that in a moment. So as we run the test a little bit longer, we see that the igniter burns and it was roughly 0.15 amps. Now, as the igniter burns, the resistance changes. So the current drops and the voltage starts changing. So we run a little bit further. You can see that the current has dropped down to nearly zero. The igniter is burned and it's broken to open circuit. So we're actually seeing the voltage of the power supply. And it's 8.61 volts. So that's the voltage required to get the igniter to burn. And we required about 0.15 amps of current to ignite the igniter. So now let's take a look at the elements of a rocket nozzle. First of all, we have the combustion chamber. Next, we have a convergence section. Now in the convergence section, the cross-sectional area of the nozzle decreases as we move towards the right. Next is the throat. It's a constant cross-sectional area and the narrowest part of the nozzle. And finally, we have the divergence section. This is also known as the exit cone. So let's take a look at the gas flow in the rocket nozzle. First of all, we have the combustion process taking place, which produces high pressure gas that wants to move from the area of high pressure in the motor to an area of low pressure outside the motor. Now this flow is subsonic. The velocity is less than the speed of sound. Now when that occurs, when we decrease the area in the convergence section, the flow velocity increases. It's like putting your thumb over the end of a hose and getting the water to squirt out faster. Now the goal is to get Mach 1 at the throat. Now when that occurs, we get supersonic flow in the divergent section. As we move towards the area of lower pressure outside the nozzle, the actual flow velocity actually increases, thus maximizing the exit velocity of the gases leaving the rocket motor. Now, there are two ways to determine thrust. As stated earlier, it's the internal gas pressure that physically creates the forward thrusting force. This is known as a pressure thrust. However, thrust can also be determined by multiplying the mass flow rate, the amount of mass flowing per second out of the motor, by the velocity of the gas, and we get momentum thrust. Now, the pressure thrust and momentum thrust are both the same thing, the forward force acting on the rocket motor. They're just two different ways to determine the thrust. Well, that's the high level basics of rocket motor thrust production. Now, there's one more facet I want to talk about, and that's the thrust curve. The thrust curve is a time-varying thrust level produced by the rocket motor. Now, that information is critical to be able to predict the flight performance of a rocket. So now, let's take a look what's happening inside the rocket motor as the propellant burns. In my simple little graphic, I have an igniter depicted in red with the black leads, and the red outlined area is the propellant inside the motor casing. At the bottom, I have a graph, which is thrust on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. Now, when I apply current to the igniter, it begins to burn and it in turn ignites the surface of the propellant. Now, initially, the propellant burns outward towards the casing wall and forward. And as it does, the burning surface area increases. This increases the pressure inside the rocket motor and also increases the thrust. Again, the surface area increases as it burns until eventually it burns to the casing wall. Now the surface area drastically drops at this point 
and the thrust drops off as well. You can see that in the points on the thrust curve. And then the motor burns from the end towards the front of the motor. This is known as the sustainer phase of the motor burn. Eventually, the propellant burns out to the forward end of the casing and the thrust drops to zero. Now, when I connect these points with a line, this creates the thrust curve, which is thrust versus time. Okay, so let's wrap things up with a static firing of a C65 model rocket motor. Now, the first view we'll see is in real time, and the second view we'll see is in slow motion at about 25% real time speed. Now let's take a look at this test in slow motion. Standing by for ignition. The initial bright flash is the quick boost phase. Now we're seeing the plume for the sustainer phase of the burn. This rocket motor only burns for about 1.3 seconds. Now this is the smoke tracking charge. And for a C65 rocket motor, this charge lasts for five seconds. Now we see the ejection charge. You notice a lot of flames coming out the end of the motor. That's why we use recovery wadding to protect the parachute during deployment. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you learned a little bit more about how rocket motors work and how rocket motors produce thrust. So hope to see you next time at LabRat Scientific.